Welcome, my name is Paula Dobriansky, and I am Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Welcome to the 16th edition of the Council's Front Page, our premier ideas platform for global leaders. Today, the Front Page is hosting a special edition of the Council series, Elections 2020, America's Role in the World, which seeks to address the future of US national security policy as it navigates the geopolitical landscape that Washington will face over the next four years and beyond. It will examine the policies and actions needed to protect and promote America's interests at home and abroad. This is not a political event or a partisan debate, but a series of exchanges that take into account the full spectrum of views that will shape and define US national security policy and America's role in the world. The Atlantic Council's nonpartisan virtual stage brings to our viewers the most prominent voices and decision makers shaping the national conversation over key issues of world affairs, including the rise of China and reemergence of great power competition, energy security, cyber warfare, the global economy, and the collision between democracy and autocracy, to name just a few. Our viewers can find the latest lineup of speakers and sign up for each event on the Atlantic Council's website. Follow us on Twitter at Atlantic Council and engage in this important conversation. Today, we are truly delighted to have with us Ambassador Robert O'Brien, National Security Advisor to US President Donald Trump. He has served in this capacity since September of 2019. Prior to holding this important position, Ambassador O'Brien served on the front lines of US diplomacy as President Trump's special envoy for hostage affairs. Ambassador O'Brien, thank you so much for joining us today. We are really delighted to have you here. And let me start with a question. According to news reports, China has protested an alleged incursion of a US U-2 spy plane into a no-fly zone imposed during a military exercise. And also, according to the same reports, it was stated that apparently Beijing had also fired two missile shots that purportedly were fired as a warning to the US military. Could you please comment on that event? Thank you for having me and thank you to the Atlantic Council for hosting me again. It's always great to be back with such a distinguished group of uh, policymakers and uh, uh, academics and uh, public intellectuals. So it's uh, it's nice to be here with you and uh, and especially with you, a, a former colleague. Uh, look, the what we've seen with China over many years now, and it's something I've been writing about for uh, well over a decade, is an increasing assertiveness and aggressiveness uh, in in the world. And it's it's uh, some of it is very malign. So, for example, you talked about the South China Sea. China has basically taken the decision with a, a nine dash line, or sometimes called the cow, cow's tongue, to annex a vast swath of the Western Pacific Ocean and and claim it as Chinese territorial waters, almost like it was talking about Lake Tahoe, uh, uh, you know, being you know, somewhere close to to Beijing as internal waterways or something. It's ridiculous. It's been rejected by. Uh, all major countries, all seafaring countries, has been rejected by the uh, the tribunal of the law of the sea, and, and now China is engaged in military uh, exercises in, in these waters that are that they consider domestic, which are by you know no stretch of the imagination domestic. The United States always reserves its right to have freedom of navigation and and freedom of aviation. Uh, in all cases, we do it in a safe manner. Uh, we do it in a, in a professional manner. Our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines always uh, participate in uh, in their in their drills uh, in, in a manner that that, that it ensures their safety and the safety of others. Uh, so we certainly reject any Chinese claims that that flights over uh, the South China Sea and their manufactured claims constitute some sort of breach of a norm or a rule. And and this is typical of Chinese behavior that we've seen recently. You saw the the recent brutal attack on the Indian patrol and the. On the LAC, the line of actual control, where uh, the Chinese brutally uh, uh, killed uh, uh, almost two dozen Indian soldiers, uh, we see the the crackdown in Hong Kong. We see 
know, there's been the the, the long term uh, efforts to bully Taiwan and uh, and uh, undermine its democracy. Uh, so so we're seeing a, a very assertive, very, a very aggressive uh, uh, China, and and the United States is not going to back down from its uh, long held principles that that the the world's ocean ways should and 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 international waters should be free for navigation, and and the same with. Uh, with with space and with with uh, uh, air rights in, in international airspace, so we're not going to back down from that. And uh, we're you know it's 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 too bad the Chinese have decided to uh, uh, to engage in further assertiveness or aggressiveness uh, in, in this circumstance. Ambassador, let me ask you a related question. The Trump administration has identified great power competition as a defining challenge of our day, and China as the number one challenge in this realm. What will it take for the United States to prevail in this competition with China? Could you articulate some of the core policy paths that the administration has pursued and will continue to pursue? Uh, that's a great question, Paul. And, and we are in a new area of great power competition. One of the impressive things that the Trump administration did in its, in its initial years was put out a national security strategy and a national defense strategy. And it's very clear that we have uh, near peer competitors with uh, Russia, with uh, with China, uh, that are trying to reshape the the global commons, that are trying to change the global norms and the the rules of the road, so to speak, that we've all operated under for the past you know seventy some years since the end of the Second World War. Uh, look, with China, we've got unique uh, challenges. Uh, you have uh, a communist party uh, of China that that is an heir to the uh, Stalin's China, or Stalin's Russian Communist Party. They've never disavowed it. They're a Marxist-Leninist party. Uh, they have total control uh, over their people, and and it's getting the the control is becoming uh, something that that Orwell wouldn't even have imagined when he wrote 1984 uh, with social credit scores and mass surveillance. They're now exporting that control. Uh, to places like Hong Kong, where they tore up the Sino-British Declaration and imposed the new national security law on, on Hong Kong and are ending democracy in, in Hong Kong. They're bullying China, they're, they're bullying uh, the Republic of China, Taiwan. They're bullying, uh, attempting to bully India. That's going to be tougher for them because the Indians are gonna, aren't going going to take it. They're going to stand up uh, for their, their own sovereign rights. Uh, so, so, number one, we have to uh, embrace what Ronald Reagan uh, talked about, which is peace through strength. And that's what President Trump did. He's rebuilt our military. Uh, he's ended defense sequestration. We've spent over $2.5 trillion uh, during the, the initial years of the administration to, to rebuild the American military. We have to stand up to China's unfair trade practices. Uh, we, we were running a $500 billion a year deficit to China, a trade deficit. Much of that was because of dumping and currency manipulation and uh, intellectual property theft. Uh, intellectual property theft on its own is a major factor that we have to address. Uh, uh, FBI Director Chris Wray recently spoke about the, the theft of American intellectual property and trade secrets by the PRC uh, has been the biggest wealth transfer in, the, in human history, uh, which is it's an amazing, uh, astounding fact. Uh, Director Wray said that they're opening a new case on espionage, both Chinese espionage with respect to our national security secrets, but also industrial espionage. Every 10 hours, uh, the FBI is almost being overwhelmed by the number of, of Chinese espionage cases. And, and so we've got to cut off the theft of intellectual property. And then third, we've got to be very concerned about Chinese access to our, our capital markets, uh, uh, where, where they participate in our capital markets but are not required to have audited financials the same way U.S. companies are and that sort of thing. And Secretary Mnuchin and the SEC with the, uh, the new rules and the Public uh, Company Accounting Oversight Board have... Uh, have taken steps there. So, look, we have to confront the Chinese across all spectrums. Uh, they're a they're a very uh, 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 dedicated uh, uh, competitor or adversary. Uh, they they work in every spectrum. Uh, you know, from from diplomacy to to the military to their their economic uh, uh, efforts. And, and many of them, you know, many of the things they do across the board just don't uh, to to you know make make it simple. They just don't follow the rules. And, uh, and, and but but I, I'm convinced the U.S. is as it always has been is up to the challenge, and President Trump has certainly shown the way. And uh, uh, whether he has a successor in a few months or in, in a few years, uh, we're leading the way so that that America can stand up to China and maintain our way of life and and defend against these uh, pernicious attacks. Ambassador, let's take this a little broader. What are some of the other primary challenges 
that you believe are confronting the United States over the next four years and then beyond? And how should we be preparing for it? And maybe at the same time, what about the opportunity that you see that we also seize? Well, another great question, Paul. Thank you. Uh, look, I, I'm optimistic about the future. We've had a tough 2020, and I think there are a lot of people that are, are ready for 2020 to be over and uh, and to move on. We faced this COVID virus that came out of China, uh, you know, the, 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 the economic uh, harm that's come along with that. We've got, obviously, hot spots around the world, uh, a lot of malign activity from Iran. Uh, the poor people of Lebanon, who've been under the thumb of Hezbollah, just recently had this terrible explo explosion in Beirut. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we've got uh, renewed uh, tension between Greece and Turkey in the Mediterranean. Uh, we have all the, the, the challenges that we have uh, with, with China. Look, we haven't even talked about Russia, and uh, uh, we, we got a, a, you know, the, the, what looks like the poisoning of, uh, of the le leading dissident in, uh, uh, in Russia. We've had, we've had other, uh, we've got the Russians uh, involved in, uh, in Syria. We've got them involved in Libya. Uh, we, 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 they, they remain in, in Ukraine. So there, there are a number of challenges around the world. Uh, you know, Afghanistan uh, is a, uh, a, a war that we've been fighting for almost 20 years now. I think we've got a, a pathway uh, to get our troops home from Afghanistan and, and hopefully to have inter-Afghan peace. I and mean, ultimately it's up to the Afghan people to, to come together and, and, and come to an accord so that they can govern themselves. Uh, we've got uh, you know, some difficulties in Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua. So, so there are plenty of, of, of challenges around the world, uh, but what I'm heartened by, number one, are the American people and, and our, our continued ingenuity, creativity, innovation. Uh, we've been having a very tough time in space over the past eight years uh, prior to the president taking office uh, because of cuts to NASA and a lack of a commitment to space. And what happened during that time period? You know, you had all these great American private sector companies, uh, uh, whether it was Bezos company or, or Musk company or Sierra Nevada, you know, together with ULM, our, you know, ULA and, and, uh, and our traditional defense contractors. And, and our private sector has really led the way in space. And, and, and you know, we just recently celebrated the, uh, the first launch of, of uh, a space capsule from American soil with American astronauts and its recovery by, uh, 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 you know, after it visited the International Space Station, its recovery here uh, and bring those astronauts back to the United States. So, uh, so that's exciting. I just returned from a trip to Latin America. We have uh, a tremendous renaissance going on in the Western Hemisphere. The, the, the countries of the Western Hemisphere are struggling with COVID. But, you know, with the exception of the three countries I mentioned, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba, uh, we have a, a hemisphere full of democracies committed to the rule of law. Uh, those countries have challenges, but they also have, uh, you know, tremendous talent, uh, populations that, that want to work hard, that are, that are innovative. Uh, so, so I think, you know, when you look at space, when you look at what the American people are doing uh, with respect to innovation here, when you look at what's happening in our hemisphere, uh, I think there are tremendous opportunities, notwithstanding the challenges that we, we have to manage around the world. Ambassador, that's terrific. It's good to hear you describe not only the challenges and the kinds of approaches for us, but also at the same time, the opportunities. Um, let me also, with that backdrop, ask you a question that many in the think tank community do preoccupy themselves with and follow very closely, and that's the question about America's role in the world, what it should be. Could you comment on what you see as the primary objectives that are guiding our U.S. engagement in the rest of the world today? What matters here? Well, I think the first thing that matters is that, that America leads. President Trump talks about uh, America first, uh, but he also makes it very clear and, and said this at the UN, that doesn't mean America alone. Uh, one of the, the, the great strategic advantages we have as we look out a, a, across the world, as we look at a rising China, as we look at a, 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 a more assertive Russia, uh, especially in, in Eastern Europe, uh, a lot of the, China and Russia have allies that they rent or that they buy. Uh, they have very few uh, true allies. Uh, we have like-minded countries that share our values, that share our way of life all around the world, and we have a very strong system of alliances. And, and that doesn't mean that everything's perfect between us all the time, but but we've got great partners, and that, that puts us in a, a very unique position uh, to lead. I, I, I grew up, as, as you did, uh, thinking of the President of the United States as the leader of the free world, thinking of America as the the last best hope, uh, the shining city on the hill, all those things that we believe in. 
Uh, President Trump believes the same thing. And, but, but at the same time, we want to make sure that our allies bear the burden and, and pay their fair share when it comes to defending the, the global commons, when it comes to defending the alliance. It can't just be the U.S. anymore. We have to have uh, a buy-in from our allies. One of the things that the president has been criticized for, I think very unfairly, is our NATO alliance. And NATO has been the most uh, successful alliance in, uh, in, in history, maybe since going all the way back to Rome and its Latian allies. Uh, but we've got a great alliance with NATO. The president was tough on NATO coming into office because NATO, the non-U.S. NATO members had, for the most part, with a few exceptions, had let their defense spending fall to record low levels. They, they had no readiness. They weren't maintaining their their platforms. Uh, they didn't have enough troops. And, and the president said, this just doesn't work. We can't continue to be the, the, the only uh, party that's seriously committed to defense. You've got to raise your game. And we went to the NATO summit last uh, December. I was privileged to be with the president. Uh, we had a lot of cooperation from Secretary General Stoltenberg. And we obtained commitments that through 2024, there'd be $400 billion in additional NATO spending by non-U.S. NATO countries uh, on defense. That's fantastic for, for the United States. It's fantastic for the Western Alliance, and, and it's great for NATO. So every president that I can remember since President Nixon, uh, the first time I started tuning into campaigns, has been asking our European allies to pay their fair share and, and, and to increase their spending to protect ourselves against Russia, now China, uh, and other threats, uh, Iran. And, and it's always fallen on deaf ears with the idea that, well, America will come through in the end. President Trump actually got something done. And, you know, a lot of folks didn't like the rhetoric that he used, but he got the deal done in a way that, that no one else, uh, at least in my lifetime, uh, has. So, so I look at our role as a leader of, uh, of like-minded countries or our, of our allies, not just in Europe, but around the world. And I also look at our role as being uh, uh, the, the one indispensable country still that can bring peace to, to the world or bring peace to regions. And you take a look at what we just did recently, what the president did in bringing together Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed and Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, and achieving for the, the first time in 26 years, and only the third time since the founding of Israel, a peace agreement between an Arab country and Israel. And uh, I'll be heading off to the region on Saturday. Uh, I, I'm gonna have the privilege of flying on the first direct flight from Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv to the airport in Abu Dhabi, uh, uh, probably on an LL uh, uh, equipment. And uh, what, what a great thing now to have the UAE, which is a, a finance center in the Middle East, uh, and a, a great uh, uh, partner of the United States and, and the startup nation, the center of innovation in the Middle East, Israel, and our, our great democratic ally there come together. So, you know, those are the sorts of things that the United States can do to bring our, our friends and allies together. Let me pick up on this theme because it's an important one. And thank you for your uh, articulation of the importance of allies and alliances. Let's go to the Indo-Pacific because the Trump administration has certainly emphasized the importance economically, militarily, politically, the Indo-Pacific. We have the quadrilateral security dialogue, uh, which involves Japan, uh, Australia, India, and the United States. And could you say a bit about how you see alliances and allies playing an important role in that arena? We were discussing China earlier, so there's a common base there. Share with us what uh, uh, the importance uh, of this issue has been to the administration. Well, Paul, as you know, I grew up in California, so I always considered the U.S. a Pacific, uh, uh, not, notwithstanding this is no, no knock on the Atlantic Council, but I always considered the United States a Pacific uh, power. And a, a lot of our, our glorious military history and naval history uh, took place in the Pacific, uh, uh, going, you know, predating World War II uh, by, by far. And, and, and so I think we've got a, we've got a, a window on the Pacific uh, that, that, that provides us with tremendous opportunities. Uh, let me just give you, let me start on the economic front. I went to, I represented the president at the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN uh, U.S. Summit uh, last fall. And, and there was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, how much investment China was making in the region and how little investment there was by the United States. So I asked our team to put together some numbers. And the United States, through our private sector, uh, through our great companies, whether they're oil companies or tech companies or auto companies or <clears throat> excuse me, pharmaceutical companies, we've put together uh, investment in the Indo-Pacific of over $1 trillion. That's private sector investment uh, among our partners in the Indo-Pacific. 
it's twice as much as China and Japan combined. Uh, so, so we play a major role in the Pacific on, on an economic front, but, but some of that is ignored because it's through the IBMs and the Microsofts and the, and the airlines and the, and the car companies and, uh, and the, the oil companies, the extraction companies, uh, all these great American uh, or, or the investors, the, uh, the financial services companies, uh, uh, the law firms. So it's an amazing uh, amount of, of, of stake that we have in the Indo-Pacific. It's, it's really the, the engine of the world economy going forward, and America is going to play a big role there. One of the ways that we can do that is providing for a safe and secure Indo-Pacific through our defense partnerships and our diplomatic partnerships with our allies. <clears throat> I think the Quad, which is really coming into its own, which is uh, the relationship between Japan, India, Australia, and the United States, is one of the most exciting diplomatic initiatives and and one of the most uh, one of the areas most uh, likely to, to succeed and pay huge dividends in the future. Uh, so I'll be meeting with our, my quad partners in uh, uh, likely in, in uh, Hawaii uh, in October uh, with with the the NSAs of, of those countries. I think Secretary Pompeo will be meeting with the foreign ministers uh, of those countries also in, in September and October. <clears throat> We're very committed to those those alliances. But there are many other like-minded countries there. We've, we've got great relationships with Singapore. We've got a great, real, you know, a ter ter terrific relationship with our, our longtime friends in uh, in Taiwan. Uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam are coming to their own. Thailand is a treaty partner. So in just country after country, we have tremendous opportunities. New Zealand uh, has, has, has re-emerged. They've always been a Five Eyes partner, but we had some, some difficulties, as you remember uh, uh, from your work back in the, the Reagan and Bush administrations with uh, nuclear visit, uh, nuclear powered uh, uh, warship visits. Uh, I think we've gotten over most of those issues with New Zealand. We have American destroyers and and cruisers visiting uh, uh, the great ports in New Zealand. So we have tremendous partnerships, tremendous opportunities. Uh, we've got great partnerships with our, our friends in the the, the island. This is probably the, you know, more on the second island chain. Uh, we delivered ventilators to to Samoa, to Tonga, to uh, Tuvalu, to Nauru, to Kiribati. Uh, so, uh, Papua New Guinea, East Timor, Timor Leste. Uh, so, so we're doing a lot in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we're doing it on a, on a uh, defense basis and, and security basis. We're doing it on a diplomatic basis. We're doing it on a humanitarian basis. Uh, but, but I think perhaps most importantly, we're doing it through investment, uh, through U.S. investment, and U.S. trade uh, in the region. And, and I think it's it's going to be one of the places. Uh, you know the the old saying of you know go west young woman or go yet west young man. Uh, I think that's uh, that's still going to remain true for for many Americans that that uh, are going to have a great future uh, uh, in the Pacific region. I wanted to ask you about General Scowcroft. Sadly, this month uh, we lost uh, General Scowcroft, a giant in national security. You have certainly been hands on on the National Security Council and in terms of uh, remodeling, shaping, and uh, General Scowcroft is constantly cited as the gold standard, the gold standard. So please share with us what your goals, what your objectives are with the National Security Council staff. Well, listen, the first thing I wanna say is uh, with respect to General Scowcroft, and I, I uh, put out a statement on, on his passing uh, what what a giant! And uh, I think every national security advisor since General Scowcroft, who's taken uh, this role, has said, "I want to be like Brent Scowcroft. I want to put the Scowcroft model in place." He had a tremendous impact on, on our our government. But as a man, he was a great patriot, a great Air Force officer. Uh, he hailed from uh, Utah, where I've got some uh, some connections, and uh, uh, he brought a dignity and and graciousness uh, and professionalism to. Uh, uh, to Washington, and, and I think sometimes that comes from uh, uh, folks that that uh, you know came from from the uh, the Inner Mountain West or from the the plains and and uh, uh, you know outside of our uh, our coast. And and I think he brought a uh, a level of sophistication uh, to to his work as a national security advisor that it's been hard for for any of us to live up to. I, when I took office, the first thing I said is I want to reinstitute the the Scowcroft model. And I viewed that as a couple of things. Number one, the, the NSC had just gotten too big. It was uh, the NSC policy staff that had become bloated. Uh, it was unaccountable. And, and I wanted to make sure that we got back to a, uh, a level of, of, of staffing where I knew the staffers, uh, where they were top-notch folks, 
and, and where we didn't have uh, uh, where we could streamline a uh, what what had become a very bloated situation. Uh, that's what uh, Brent had done when when he was here. Uh, he operated, uh, I think, under the the, uh, the Ford administration. I think he had thirty policy uh, staffers. Uh, it grew a little bit by the time he came back with George H. W. Bush, President George H. W. Bush. Uh, but he ran a very lean operation. I wanted to do that. Number two, pri he made process uh, his ally. And, and, and look, you know, you've been ambassador at the State Department. I have been. And when, when you're when you're outside of it, sometimes you, you get a little frustrated by the NSC process, by the PCCs and the DCs and the PCs. But at the end of the day, it's that process that allows us to get the best advice, the best options uh, vetted and, and in front of the president. And, and oftentimes, that by, by running the full process and, and, and finding out where the pitfalls are, the traps are in a, a potential policy or a reaction to some world event that takes place, uh, you know, we, we keep America safer. And I think Pre General Scowcroft understood that better than many national security advisors and, and many people in, in, in foreign policy. Uh, so, so I've run, I think, uh, our team has run over 200 DCs and PCs uh, in the last year since I've been in office. I think we may have, have had a record on that front. And what that allows us to do is get a consensus uh, up to the present, or where there's not a consensus, it comes to General Scowcroft's kind of the, the, the third thing that I distilled from, from the Scowcroft model, and that is being the honest broker. And, and we try not to take a policy position as NSC staff or my, myself as National Security Advisor, it doesn't mean I don't have positions, and, and I certainly had you know, well-developed pos you know, positions on a variety of issues before coming here, but it's really for the president to hear from his cabinet uh, secretaries and his heads of departments and agencies, when there's, especially when there's a dispute among them, it, it's good for him to hear that, for them to have their day in court, to be able to make their argument to the president, and then at the right time, the president can turn to me if, if he's so inclined and say, hey, what do you think of, of, of this issue? What do you think of these arguments? And, and I can weigh in. But what I've tried not to do, and I, I think General Scowcroft was a great model of this, is I've tried to bring some integrity where we're not putting into the process, where we're not putting our thumb on the scale as, as the NSC staff uh, for a particular policy or, or, or advice to the president, uh, but, but being available to the president after he's heard from his, his, uh, his National Security Council itself uh, then being able to, when the president asked, to give him, you know, my thoughts on an issue. So th in those three areas, with with uh, lean staff, with uh, a heavy reliance on process, and with uh, trying to maintain uh, uh, integrity in the in the in the the judicious use of advice for the president after letting the, the cabinet secretaries be heard, uh, I, I've tried to emulate that. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I was impressed. I, I've been a long time admirer of General Scowcroft, but. Sitting in the chair that he once occupied, uh, I, I've got even more uh, more respect for the, the the dignity and the professionalism that he brought to the office. Well, thank you for that, uh, Ambassador. I have one final question, Ambassador, uh, uh, and it's a big one, but I'd like to ask you: What do you consider the major foreign policy achievements? You've re referred to some during the Trump administration thus far, and what would you like to accomplish in a potential second Trump term? Uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. I think it's a, it's a bit of an overlooked question because I think the president has had a, just a terrific uh, run of, uh, of policy successes. And I, just in the time that I've been here, uh, the president was able to negotiate a ceasefire between uh, Kurds and Turks that saved thousands of lives. Uh, the, the, the president, as we discussed earlier, uh, was able to encourage NATO countries to spend you know, 400 billion more on their own defense and on our collective defense. Uh, the, the president uh, came into office uh, with the Middle East aflame and uh, with a, a caliphate the size of Great Britain stretching across Syria and Iraq. He destroyed the physical caliphate. And, and, and uh, late last year, he was able to bring justice to Akar uh, uh, al-Baghdadi, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and a, a guy who had been a, a real monster and, and killed a number of Americans, including Kayla Mueller and, and, and Saloff and Kasich and, and Foley. Uh, American journalists and aid workers who were, were brutally killed. You know, not not to mention the the the, the thousands of Yazidis and Christians and uh, uh, and and Muslims that he killed uh, in in his caliphate. We ended the caliphate. We brought justice to Baghdadi. We restored uh, the president restored deterrence with Iran. Uh, he got out of the disastrous JCPOA, which, in my view, and I wrote about this at the time that it was uh, entered into. I thought it was the worst uh, diplomatic deal that uh, the West had been engaged in, had been involved in since 1938. 
in Munich. It was just a terrible deal that put Iran on the path to a nuclear weapon, as the Israelis have now demonstrated when they uh, obtained the documents from uh, out the warehouse outside of Tehran. Uh, it put them on the path to, to achieving uh, uh, the ability to, to buy and sell advanced uh, conventional arms uh, that, would, that would have taken place this year under JCPOA. So we got out of JCPOA, we put maximum pressure on Iran. <clears throat> that maximum pressure on Iran in turn set the stage uh, for the recent uh, peace agreement that you saw between uh, the UAE and Israel. And, and again, uh, just by achieving that, that agreement alone, uh, that, that puts the president in the, in the same league as Jimmy Carter with the Camp David Accords or, or uh, uh, President Clinton with the, uh, uh, the deal between Israel and Jordan. It puts, and, and it certainly puts uh, Bibi Netanyahu in the category of Menachem Begin or uh, Perez or Rabin or uh, the Crown Prince, uh, MBZ, in the same league as, as Sadat or King Hussein. So uh, a major achievement, I think, standing up for our allies, moving our embassy to Jerusalem, uh, really sent a message to the world that uh, that we stand by our allies. Uh, every president in the past five or six elections has gone to their convention and, as a candidate and said, I'm going to move the embassy to Jerusalem, and then they didn't do it uh, and, and were talked out of it by, by the foreign policy establishment. Uh, the president had the, the courage to do it. He recognized Golan. So uh, we've done a lot in the Middle East, but, I'll, you know, all of that, uh, I think, you know, the, 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 those are all impressive accomplishments, but I think the thing he may be most noted for in history is standing up for the first time in 40 years to communist China. And, uh, you know, the, the, the COVID virus obviously coalesced a lot of people around that message, but we, we've stepped back and we've watched what they've done through unfair trade practices to our industry, uh, hollowing out the American manufacturing uh, center in the, in the middle of our country. We've watched what they've done to our great companies through the theft of intellectual property, how We've seen great American tech companies and, and hardware companies go out of business because the Chinese stole their IP and then sold it back to us cheaper. Uh, he, he's, he's standing up to them on that front. Uh, we're, we're standing up to them on the, uh, on the uh, capital markets front. And, and most importantly, we're rebuilding our defenses and, and taking a peace through strength posture, not just to the Chinese, but to the Russians and all of our adversaries. So uh, I, I think the president has a record of accomplishment uh, over the past four years that, that's really astounding. There was a great article in the uh, the Wall Street Journal op-ed the other day that uh, uh, that commented on this and talked about the president's terrific foreign policy record that uh, that many of the establishment, uh, many of your friends and my friends don't want to acknowledge, but it's it's been pretty spectacular. Ambassador, a terrific session, very insightful, very comprehensive, and we truly are most appreciative, knowing how pressed you are with your time, that you took time today to be part of the 16th edition of Front Page at the Atlantic Council. So thank you for that. And it's a real delight seeing you. Thank you. Wonderful to be here and wonderful to be with the council. Thank you so much, Paula.